From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies, and your host for Big Ideas. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations, present and past, who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Joining me today are Ryan Redcorn and Dr. Cynthia Barron to discuss indigenous representation in film, television, and other media. Ryan joins us as a guest speaker for the In the Round series, featuring Native American creatives in the fine and performing arts. Ryan is an Osage artist skilled in photography, graphic design, filmmaking, and screenwriting. He co-founded the comedy troupe The 1491s, which is known for its incisive videos, stage performances, and community activism. In 2022, he made his mark in the world of narrative filmmaking with his debut short film, Dead Bird Hearts. In 2007, Ryan founded Buffalo Nickel Creative Agency, which does video, photography, and design work for clients ranging from Paramount Pictures to the Native Forward Scholars Fund. Ryan's current creative work includes serving as a staff writer on the critically acclaimed television series, Reservation Dogs. Cynthia is a professor in the Department of Theater and Film at BGSU. She's also the editor of the Journal of Film and Video, the publication of the University Film and Video Association. She has published on independent cinema, film aesthetics, industry conditions, and performance styles. Thank you both so much for being here with me today. Ryan, I'd like to have you start out to tell us a little bit, for folks who don't know, about your background. And specifically, what were some of the key turning points in your career leading up to your current work, including being a screenwriter, but also some of your other current projects? What has been the kind of shape of that journey for you? After I moved back to Oklahoma in 2006, I was only there for a short time before I met one of my really good friends, now Sterling Harjo. And um, Sterling at the time had just finished his first feature film called Four Sheets to the Wind. I hadn't met him while this film was touring around, and we knew a lot of the same people. And uh, when I first met him, I told him the only Hollywood story that, that I even had in my whole life experience then and he uh turned around and wrote it as a scene into the movie Barking Water once he made Barking Water um it got into Sundance and I got to travel around with the film and just kind of it's a indie budget so I'm pretty sure I was traveling around on my own dollar no one's having me go anywhere and that was the first time I was in front of the camera too. When you get experience like that, especially that early, you get a real sense for not just like what films are being classified as indigenous cinema, but what stories are getting funding. And there's a real distinction between those two things. And a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, these are the this is what's coming out of indigenous cinema. This is the stories of indigenous people, but like by and large, indigenous people do not control that process either. And it's something that may go unnoticed as one-offs, uh, but at a film festival where all the films are and you see them back to back to back to back, there is an overwhelmingly, and this is just film in general, not just indigenous cinema, but film festivals in general, seem to have like a really heavy-handed emotional tone. And that can oftentimes lead to a race to the bottom of like what are the most, the easiest, most heavily emotional things that we can talk about. 
and it also boxes you in and like how you talk about them or, or the way that you present them. And, uh, comedy really doesn't have a place in that, but Sterling had me in this film. It's a scene that could have been easily cut. It doesn't add anything to the film other than, uh, it's funny. Um, it's not really like by technical terms, like adding to the story per se. Um, but it's a funny scene in an otherwise like fairly dramatic and also comedy, uh, comedic moments. I saw that film get screened in front of a room full of native people and it screens as a comedy. And I saw this film screen in front of not native people and, uh, nobody laughed. Everybody's crying. Sterling has this great story about showing the film in Italy and he thought it was bombing because everybody was dead quiet. And at the end, people were crying and like standing ovation and stuff like that. So it's like different cultures. They read stuff differently. They, they gravitate towards different types of stories. But uh, the thing that affected me the most from that experience was I, I watched myself on screen, but not for the sense of like seeing myself in a movie. I, I would go into those screenings that I would turn around and I would face the crowd. And when my scene came on, I would see like 300 indigenous people like laughing their ass off. And that completely changed the way that I was like wanting to spend my energy. Prior to that, I had started like a political t-shirt company called Democrates and a lot of the art and design work and stuff that I was doing was sometimes comedic, but a lot of it was dealt with just a lot of anger and hostilities I had towards like the systems that were in place that had been so heavy handed in shaping my early life experience. Um, and that was really the blade that I had spent the most time sharpening. Um, around the time that I was in Barking Waters, I was kind of transitioning out of that and into a different headspace. And so after seeing like that happen over and over again, it just made, it just really solidified me wanting to spend like all of my energy doing comedy and making people laugh as like a form of power a form of resilience. And then once you like have that in your head, it's hard to get it out. And then when you go back and you watch these films that are getting curated from these festivals and you see the absence of comedy and you see the absence of indigenous comedy, even when not in it, or even when our own people are writing stuff, like that's the stuff that primarily up till recently, recent times, primarily was what was getting made. And, uh, then you just start to understand like, okay, here is a, uh, there's an underlying thirst for the, uh, what would you say the, the under, there's an underlying thirst for stories where Indians are in decline. There's stories of like those stories require the character arcs of indigenous people to be um, in a declining state. And either that's a snapshot of that declining state or a literal removal. And, uh, and it is, it, and it's used in two different ways. One is, Oh, look how greedy white people are. Uh, this was perfect and then we ruined it. That's like the liberal version of it. And then there's the other version, which is uh, they don't deserve it and we can do better with these resources than they are. And that's the conservative Republican version of it. But uh, both stories require Indians to have it and then not have it. They require them to be in order and then they require them to end in chaos and being dismantled. So there's this idea that in order for progress to occur, Indian people have to go away. And I think part of that erasure 
is the exclusion of comedy from the vocabulary of how people understand indigenous people, which, I mean, when you're asking like, how did I make that turn? It's, it's centered on the idea of watching films that had indigenous people in them, people that I've known, people that I met, actors that this is the work that's out there for them. If you're an indigenous actor, they have to take those roles. That's what's available. Um, but that is, uh, I didn't, they were not reflective of my community. And so for those reasons, kind of like steered me in the direction that I've kind of been in for the last several years. Good. We'll get into some of those experiences shortly. Thank you, Ryan. Cynthia, can you give us a little bit about how you came into your work as a scholar of film? Did you always know that's what you wanted to do? Or was your path shaped by kind of lucky breaks, connections, things like that? The right people in the right time? Yeah, well, I can quickly answer that because I'm I'm actually most interested in just a quick follow-up to Ryan's thoughts there. Can I just take a detour? One of the things, Ryan, that you know, you're talking about that I'm, I'm reminded of is that when somebody is laughing and smiling and feeling good about themselves, they're taking up space in a whole range of ways. And I think that that's why it's threatening to, uh, or not threatening, but doesn't fit the script for dominant culture, and it doesn't fit the script for the institutions that oftentimes fund Indigenous projects. I mean, I know exactly the, the stories that you're talking about, essentially, you know, trauma porn sort of, of that sort. So, at any rate, I think it's um I think one of the things that's really remarkable and and fantastic about what you've done individually and also what the 1491s have done as a group and then, you know, various folks have done it as connected to that is that you guys really are taking up cultural space and and shifting the entire paradigm it's there's no there's a not a some sort of simple-minded celebration but a kind of uh a combination of laughing to keep from crying laughing in the face of uh people who don't even get what's going on. Um, just a whole combination of things that is just really, really impressive and awe-inspiring. Um, and um, David Traer has written about how, you know, from, you know, the 500-year anniversary of Columbus's arrival, about the the rise of cultural activism and the importance of taking, of not just trying to get land back, but also cultural space back. And the fact that it's actually happening is absolutely so <laughs> impressive. And it's taken so much work and smarts on people's part that even an old lady out in the middle of uh, a cornfield can can notice. So thank you. And awesome. Oh, you're welcome. We've been kind of talking about, you know, Ryan, you started off with kind of the dominant narratives, right? The images that folks who think of, you know, indigenous people in films are probably thinking of. And I'm I'm recalling not only the Westerns of the, you know, 50s, but the kind of dances with wolves, you know, some of those sorts of mainstream depictions that do fit into that vanishing Indian trope from a hundred years ago or more. Siddhya, could you sort of talk a little bit about how shifts within um, maybe starting or in part by the rise of independent cinema, we started seeing space for some of these different kinds of representations 
that sort of break out of those conventions? Well, I I think Ryan could probably speak better to 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 how the mainstream representations are striking him. I mean, there are examples like Prey and there's the upcoming series Echo. And so I'm I'm not sure. I mean, there there are thoughts that I have about how the mainstream changes. But what's really, really striking is that what has what has changed or what has really evolved alongside independent cinema is open access media. And the 1491s are referred to as the, the OGs of YouTube. Did you know that, Ryan? I've been told <laughs> lately. I didn't know. I didn't know that happened, but that's what yes. I've been told. So I mean, you folks were were putting up films that you know shaped sort of you know open access media for people who are outsiders, and so there's a, there's a couple things going on. One is that there's 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 technology that that makes that possible. Okay, so that's possible. But the other thing that's happening is that there's just a, a process of it's it's beyond cord cutting and it's beyond just thumbing your nose at dominant culture. It's of it's just, just not necessary. We can do our work and it's by and for people in our community. And there's a celebration and a recognition of the beauty and and wonder and silliness and eccentricities of, you know, particular group of of outsiders, whether we're talking about indigenous folks across the globe or if you're talking about queer women or if you're talking about anyone who's not had a chance to even be at the mainstream table. I mean, it goes, I mean, it's, there's all these different registers of it. I mean, for example, Ava DuVernay's film Selma from a few years ago didn't get any recognition by the academies. And, and she's like, eh, I don't care. Screw the Oscars. You know, I'm recognized by the, uh, by the NAACP Image Awards. We're good. We're good. It's no problem. Um, so I think that I think that that's a really key piece that it's less less a matter of will Hollywood ever change or dominant media ever change because it's just so entrenched in empire and capitalism and I mean there's just it's it's a it's kind of I don't have a lot of hope. But there's a whole other universe out there that human beings are accessing. And once they also once they also see themselves on screen, then they also become media makers. And it's just fantastic. Ryan, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about kind of the the moment we are in, right? That you as a creator with the rise of or the democratization of some of these tools, right? You don't have to have a $50,000 camera to make something now, right? You could just use your iPhone, right? Better tools may add certain dimensions, but they aren't a requirement to get your stuff out there, right? Like through YouTube, things like that. How did you approach that idea of becoming a maker yourself? Right. And making use of YouTube to speak directly to audiences. What was that experience for you? And how does that correlate to the kinds of stories you wanted to tell that you weren't seeing in the kind of Hollywood and studio system? The answer is kind of easy. Film and video or movies or TV or whatever you want to call it is a collaborative process. And in that collaborative process, you have writers, directors, editors, producers, funders, financiers. You have people all the way down to wardrobe 
hair and makeup, da 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 da. And when you have all, when when you when you understand it as a as a collaborative process, then you can begin to understand like even if you insert indigenous people into key parts of that equation, there's so much editorialization that happens but before your eyeballs ever get to see it. And everybody whose fingerprints are on it touches it and affects it in some kind of way. And I think um, what we were responding to uh, really kind of, it wasn't conscious. We just was like, as friends, this is how we behave as friends. And then you include the video camera and you include these little projects and that kind of stuff. We start making films and uh, there was no, there was never an intent to start the 1491. There was only an intent of Sterling and I, while we were traveling to uh, Minneapolis for a screening of Barking Water to link up with some guys that he knew peripherally through Sundance and we had seen their videos. They had done some stuff and Sterling and I had done some stuff and we just wanted to like what would see what would happen if we made some stuff together even though they're on the other side of the country. And that was when we made uh, Wolfpack Auditions. Twilight had come out that weekend and um, none of us had bothered to see it but we just, you know, we had this concept we just did it just to make ourselves laugh and kind of went for it and uh, put it up on the internet. And then it just kind of like, I guess this is before people started calling things viral. It just kind of took off. It's also before Facebook had these really strong headed algorithms, which uh, didn't suppress YouTube links before Facebook had its own video platform that they were pushing. And so it was really just like, what you would see is legit word of mouth. And over the course of that group existing, like we literally saw that happen. Like the first videos we did, they went like wildly everywhere. People saw them and shared them. And as Facebook like clamped down, we I saw those numbers like diminish so fast. And, you know, we slowly withdrew from that platform. And uh, around that time we started working on our play together and we had a live show and um, I guess by then we got it just under the wire because it would be really difficult to kind of do the same now because the format is like one minute, 30 seconds, 10 seconds and we were doing kind of longer form one to five minute. I think uh, that film that I mentioned earlier was like seven or eight minutes long. So it really kind of forcibly changed underneath it and that's just a, another ex example of like editorial fingerprints you know they want you to pay for your own people that have already made a decision to follow you and you know in that in that sense right what you're talking about there ryan is the ways in which even if you manage to independently finance a film to get distribution wide enough you still have to go through those big players, right? Yeah, yeah. This is what I really miss is because like around the time that I fell in love with movies, the late 80s and early 90s, uh, I miss being able to walk into a video store and picking something. Or uh, I watched a lot of USA Up All Night on Friday and Saturday night. And like, I just don't see how you can make a Killer Clowns from Outer Space or a toxic Avenger now and not have theatrical release and still be able, like somebody has to be okay with making a million dollar movie and getting $1.5 million back or $2 million back like that. The model has to be okay with that. Or even, even a hundred thousand dollar movie and getting $300,000 in return. Like the, the people who are in charge of the distribution have completely crushed that and and you know to much to their own detriment because that's the pipeline that feeds their people so like they're putting themselves in a situation where they need content and they're going to end up taking 
somebody with no set experience, half cocked ideas, barely uh, thought out story structure. Like to somebody who hasn't like spent years honing their craft and they're going to throw them into situations where they might inevitably fail and then hurt their career if they don't get a second shot um, based off of either connections or maybe they're actually like some small amount of talent that had to be developed further. These things take time and years. Like you can, you can read about doing the thing. You can be taught about doing the thing, but you can't actually learn it really until you do the thing. And I think like those independent stories are, you know, thus that, that creates the groundswell of those cultural shifts. And even the way that a lot of the stuff is like on TV now, like I, I can't tell the difference between the director's fingerprints are like not on the projects. If you had, uh, taken somebody and just like, for example, if there's just an eccentric director or whatever, and they got a small amount of money and they're allowed to make a really weird movie. At this point, based off the content that I'm seeing a lot of online, or I mean, in, from the streamers and other stuff, I would rather see like a mistake written, like technically flawed film over the, the like race to the middle that we kind of have now. I'd rather see a weirdos, uh, like half, like I, I sat through an hour and a half of this Nigerian action film. It was absolutely ridiculous. And the, the filmmaker who, the guy who made it is doing a voiceover, like director commentary over the whole thing. And that is the film, like his director comment. Like that's the film that they released is him doing director commentary over his film that he already made. And like, I loved the hell out of it. And I, and I just loved it so much more because like you could tell this guy has so much love for storytelling that it's uh that it's existing like outside. He doesn't care. He just wants to tell a story. He wants to do it in his community. He loves American action films. There's certain aspects about those films that he loves. The um, particularly ones that he's mimicking are the ones from the late eighties, early and mid nineties, like that era of action film, but like you just couldn't, there's so many great films that were made during that time. Those stories will always want to be told. People will want to tell those, but in the same way that indigenous people are not able to get our stories out, the general note, it's not just indigenous people. It's, it's, uh, oh, it's a long list of other people who are being kept out. And yes, the democratization has helped that has like built up proof of demand but that but the value of that is not like fully realized and being invested into as like a potential distribution model we're going to take a quick break thanks for listening to the big ideas podcast if you are passionate about big ideas consider sponsoring this program to have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Hello, and welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Ryan Redcorn and Cynthia Barron about Indigenous filmmaking and changes to the industry. Cynthia, you recently published an article entitled Fourth Cinema Genre Mashup that examines the television show Reservation Dogs and other works by the 1491s. Can you tell us about what that term fourth cinema refers to and how you see some of those ideas in 1491s as well as any of other work that Ryan has done as a photographer, writer, filmmaker, and designer. Yeah, well, I feel a little silly talking about it since, you know, I'm the old white lady in the middle of the cornfield. But at any rate, here we go. But I, but I, I, I want to know because I have no idea what fourth <laughs> wave cinema is. So I'm really curious. Yeah, so... So let's go back. So there's first cinema, which is Hollywood, and there's second cinema, which is European art cinema. And then starting in the mid-20th century, following the um, 
uh, breakdown of the British Empire and other events, arrival of Cuba and the map and so forth. So there's the arrival of third cinema, which is in some ways related to third world cinemas, but is a, is a third way. It's outside of uh, movies that are appealing to commercial tastes and outside of movies that are appealing to the elites. And instead, these movies are designed to, to decolonize minds and to facilitate historical consciousness and connect local and international struggles and also move beyond the binaries that are so much so hardwired into, into Western thinking, at least. I'm limited in my understanding of the world. So, so for cinema then actually predates third cinema, but it becomes for cinema just in the way it gets talked about. It's actually Barry Barclay's term. He's a Maori filmmaker has some important films from the 90s, beginning in the 90s. And what he talks about is that he wants, he wants there to be movies that are from the point of view of people on the shore, not from the point of view of the people on the ship. That's step one. And then also that there isn't a focus on the friggin' people on the ship. So there's, it's, it's not simply an obsession with the colonizers, which is the kind of thing that you were talking about earlier, Ryan, where it's just, you know, this is what's happened and so forth. But instead, to actually find a way to use technology of different sorts to celebrate things that have been, that are woven into specific cultural traditions. And so then it, they can, they can reactivate, celebrate popular memory as opposed to mass memory, which has been, which has been created by uh, this, this fabricated media landscape. So does that catch us up? Yes. And uh, Ryan, I'd love for you to maybe talk about some examples of the work you've done with the 1491s to how you and your friends creating your own work were maybe trying to challenge that what you talked about at the beginning, the notion of like, here's how this will be received by predominantly white audiences. Here's how other indigenous folks view it. What were you as makers focused on? And how did that show up in some of those projects? So things like the 2009 video, Bad Indians, or the 2011 video, Smiling Indians. Could you pick one of those as an example and talk us through how you were thinking about audience and storytelling? Well, there's the bad answer. We didn't care. And, um, you know, what Cynthia is referring to and some of the stuff she said is like, there's this, um, I'll just call it implicit bias that when indigenous people tell their stories that somehow non-native people have to be a part of that. And that's because every indigenous story that they've ever seen on the screen had whites and Indians in it. And we were just concerned with uh, making each other laugh. It was not even like, I mean, even like I would even say not even for the rest of the community. It was just us as friends. Uh, because after, though so in, in the Wolfpack auditions, I'm standing there nearly naked with a turtle shell over my crotch and uh, pretending to be a wannabe Indian, which I'm white passing so I can, I get away with a lot of stuff in that aspect of it, which is something also I've never seen uh, in cinema, but like, I'm not offended that white passing Indians are just like not been included in the, 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 the cinematic history of indigenous people. Like, I don't, I don't care. Um, it doesn't matter to me, but 
what didn't matter was that uh, one of our um, one of our uh, highly esteemed tribal community members, uh, who's a lobbyist, accomplished lawyer, uh, he helped to get the uh, Violence Against Women Act passed in 2013. Um, he's one of our tribal members, and when he saw, his name's Wilson Pipestone. When he saw me on screen, he called me up, and um, I think he hadn't said it explicitly, but I, I, I suspect he had uh, wanted me to pursue some political aspirations. At the time, my dad was in the Osage Congress and then later became the assistant principal chief of the Osage Nation. And, um, my family's like uh, a lot of political uh, activists and uh, political engagement in our family. And he called me up and he goes, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. Some things cannot be undone. And I was like, ah, I think I'll be all right. We'll see, you know? And there's like, there's that, you know, you're trying to, a lot of people in your community, and I understand it too, like trying to protect you so you can provide for your family and like not act up too much. And, but, you know, it just, it, it's reached a point where, you know, we made that gamble. We didn't have anything to lose. Everything's, you know, so much has gone, like even from a generation standpoint, like, not having access to the things that had previous generations had access to as far as economically, like you're down to like lower and lower amounts of ways to make a living and stay in your community. The internet changed that the internet coming to our small communities changed that, uh, it changed it for a lot of people. And so I think, um, if you think about that kind of stuff too much, like you're going to end up creating like really terrible art. And I think, probably what's happening with a lot of the stuff that's getting made I mean I don't want to try to disrespect any other filmmakers because or writers or anything like that because it is so unbelievably impossibly hard to get anything made that like I think just getting a project like funded shot completed and just and distribute and distributed is such an amazing an accomplishment and should be celebrated but my God, it's just, I don't know. There's a gap there and I would rather see it be not so many, not so many hands in the, in the pot. Everybody's trying to like take something and they're not interested in the story. They're just trying to flip, flip a property, make an investment, flip it, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I get it. It's from a business standpoint, but like, I, I just miss, like there was, there was so many films that used to be made where people did not consider that they were just intent on the craft and intent on like making their voice clear and people got out of the way of that voice and they respected it and that seems to have changed and it, it for the for the detriment and I think for the content that I've been able to create in projects that I've been a part of I think that's happened because we were so far we were orbiting so far away from everything else that the mechanisms that are used to control and manage the bulk of storytelling they were not those that infrastructure was like not present for us and so we're just kind of like you know do whatever we want and if people watch it they watch it like it's great you you've got also the in addition to uh, videos. I mean, there's also all your work as a um, as a photographer. I'm curious. I mean, one of the things that really strikes me. Okay, so I'm you know again, the white lady in the cornfield. Uh, they're just they're exquisite in terms of color, in terms of the way the person is each one is different and and the way they fit into their background and I, I don't know just a lot of thought has gone into them so i appreciate all of that just from my standpoint but my my sense is that the reason that these 
photographs are so powerful is that they're taken by you and you have a rapport with the people who you're photographing and that these images are not for old ladies like me in the cornfield, that they're actually for family members, community members. So can you talk about your photography? I think that's my question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's two things. The one is when I'm photographing people, as a general rule, I think the, the best thing you can do is just get out of the way. And I don't think that people who have photographed indigenous people have done a very good job of getting out of the way. And honestly, I mean, I want to get sound like I'm talking shit because I kind of am. Uh, but there was another photographer, non-native photographer, who um, got some really big exposure and uh, in a major publication. And went around to a lot of colleges. I don't know if they were at this college, but a lot of colleges, a lot of speaking stuff. And um, we're saying some like really, like if, if, if you've broken cinema down into like four waves, I would say that this guy is continuing the work of Edward Curtis and people that came after him in the sense of like reinforcing the narrative that indigenous people are going to disappear. And I saw his photography work. I had in, uh, my mom was a photographer. My mom was white. We had a dark room in our house on the reds growing up that my dad built for her, like over the bathtub. So he like nailed some two by fours into the side of the bathtub and had a perfect piece of plywood that fit in there. And there was a, and larger and chemicals and stuff like that. They actually, you know, cleaned it, cleaned the stuff in the bathtub underneath. Um, and so my, my, uh, both my parents did darker work. Um, my mom's mom sent me to do darkroom stuff in Philbrook and Tulsa, which is a big museum over there or the Gilcrease, both those places. And, uh, I, then I got to high school and I still had darkroom stuff. And by the time I got to college, I had already kind of master. I don't know master. I want to say master, but I knew the technical aspects of how ISO and stop and shutter speed, like interacted with each other. Um, then I had a really great photo two teacher at the university of Kansas state, Pak Chi Lao, who like really showed me how to, um, talk with the camera. And, um, and I really enjoyed photography, uh, but I graduated with a degree in graphic design and I graduated and started designing logos for a lot of native nonprofits, tribes, native owned businesses, stuff like that. When I saw this guy's work and I saw what he was saying about it at this time, I was well, I was well on my way into the 1491s and um by that time i was able to start saving money and uh from doing comedy work and comedy performance and i saved up for a really really long time and i dropped an exorbitant amount of money on because i looked at his work and i thought this is just access to equipment i didn't think his work was particularly like that great there was nothing like absolutely fantastic technically that I was seeing. And so I was like, nah, I'm just I'm gonna go let this slide. So I bought a whole lot of camera equipment. I bought a whole lot of lights and I just started pulling people into my life and photographing them with the intent of like, just putting the images on the internet and just see what happens. There's no other thought. Into other than like, I don't like what this guy's saying. I can, I don't see people like that. I don't believe what he's saying. And the only reason he's allowed to say that is because he has access to equipment that I, that most people don't. I go, I do. And I know how to use that equipment. So I got it. I started photographing. I put stuff up 
And then what happened in a very, very short period of time is I like really fast started getting photography work and then I in commercial work with a lot of like national brands and stuff like that. And then on top of that, museums, particularly university museums, started buying these 10, because I refused to print any smaller. I would like, people would call me to print. They were like, we want to buy a print. And I would say, I'm only selling this at 10 feet because I want to take up space. That was the whole point of photographing is to take up space. So I had a medium format camera. If I execute the picture good, I can print at eight foot by 10 foot. And then I'm not precious as a photographer. So I use a lot of like uh, graphic design or advertising type of technology in order to make my 10 foot prints. And I don't know how many I've sold, maybe six or seven of them. I've there, there, it seems to be increasing and I'm not even like, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I'm like not spending a lot of time, like as like photo, like promoting myself as a photographer. It's just something that I was doing. I love that as partly as a way for our last question, which is, you know, part of the purpose of the podcast is to reach out to students, BGSU students and community members to think about kind of how they can take steps in the world to kind of create the change that they want to see. And so my question is, you know, what advice do you have for young people who want to use their creative talents or their, you know, interest in politics and advocacy to make the kinds of changes they want to see in the world. Any advice to those young people trying to figure out where to start, how to get started? Don't ever listen to anybody that talks too much. If you're going into a community or a space that you're not familiar with, don't settle for the first person that talked to you. That's usually the worst person to talk to you. In every community, there's always somebody that is like in a big hurry to get in front of a camera or get in front of a microphone. And oftentimes that will produce the worst, most predictable result from your experience. If you're, you know, documenting, if you're a documenter, filmmaker, photographer, you're a storyteller. If you're a storyteller, you're going in a community that you don't uh, know anything about. You have to find those people and then you have to figure out how to get out of the way. And like any time I work for a community, uh, the end result of that work, whether it's graphic design, photography, filmmaking, whatever it is, I want that project to look like it did not have my fingerprints on it. I want it to feel like it came from that community and that I only was the conductor of the situation. And But you have to be able to like, you have to be intimately familiar with your own background and your own people and your own space in order to make those kind of decisions. I don't know. For a lot of younger people, they really focus on like the hot take type reaction. And like the hot take sometimes is, sometimes it's good, but so many times it's like that's already been discussed. And because it's a, if there's a level of narcissism to a discovery, that is like prevalent throughout Western society. And it's like moved from the explorer to the person who like just discovered some fact and like they are now the owner of that information. And there's just so much conversation that has to happen in order for you to like understand like fundamentally how to do it, but that shouldn't stop you from doing it. And I hope that for the younger generation that their peer group would allow them to make mistakes and not hold those mistakes to them. I think it stresses them out and it prevents them from making the art in the first place. That would be my advice to them. Great. Cynthia, any advice you want to share? I'll listen to Ryan. All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today, Ryan and Cynthia. Listeners can keep up with other ICS happenings by following us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. 
please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. The script was researched and written by Ahmed Dalal. Sound engineering was provided by Brandon Akatura and Marco Mendoza. <laughs>